Hello, and welcome to the $1,000 Authors Show. <laughs> I'm Vicky Fraser, and this is my husband, Joe. Hello. Hello. Did you know that whenever we start this show, you're always, like, really defensive with your arms crossed? Is it because you've got a spot? Would you like to point everybody's attention <laughs> at my forehead spot? Yes. <laughs> For, for those for those listening to the podcast, it just took Joe a full three seconds <laughs> to, <laughs> to find his own forehead. <laughs> it's because I'm looking at a picture of me on a screen and everything's left, right, reversed. It's just it's just wrong. Yeah. Anyway, welcome to the One Thousand Authors <sighs> Show. I'm Vicky Fraser, and this is my husband Joe. Hello. Hello. And today we are. Well, I'm drinking water. You refuse to drink. I'm. I mean, I didn't refuse to drink. It's, it's not like <laughs> no, it's not re- like I'm being. You refused. Waterboarded or anything. <laughs> you refused the offer of a drink, is what I meant. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm drinking half a glass of water. We've, again, it's, not for everyone. Um, today we're talking about how to avoid looking like an amateur. <laughs> <laughs> you would think, maybe. It seems so ironic. <laughs> What you need to do is really poorly prepare for a podcast and then just sit down giggling would, would do it. Because that's professionalism personified. Also, if you're watching... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you're watching the video version of this. My, my hair looks pretty cool. I dyed it this morning on my own without the help of Joe because he refused to get out of bed. Again, I did not refuse to get out of bed. <laughs> I had no notice. The first I heard was Vicky came clumping up the stairs with a towel wrapped around her head. <laughs> that was me waking up. I, I, I didn't have a towel wrapped around my head because that would have made the towel all blue. Anyway, I did a really good job and my face isn't blue at all and the bathroom isn't blue and not even my ears are blue. Look. I mean, not in this light, they're not, no. <laughs> they're not blue anyway. Anyway, <clears throat> Joe, what are you reading at the moment? Oh, God. Well, I finished Neuromancer by William Gibson. Um, it was pretty good. The first half was better than the second half. It got a little bit... You, do you remember the film Inception? No. I mean, I, I know oh, of its okay. existence. I don't really remember it. So, so there's lots of kind of realities inside realities, inside realities, and it all gets a little bit like, what on earth is going on now? That is ringing a bell. Um, and it's the, the, the kind of descended into that a little bit towards the end. Okay, okay. Um, otherwise, pretty good. What are you reading now? Um, some... Things I learned and some children I taught or something. Right. Only one of my favourite books that I've read in the last few years. Um, some Kids I Taught and What They Taught Me. That's the one. By Kate Clancy. I've, I've read like the first chapter or two. What do you think so far? It's very nice. Oh, I yeah. my eyes. Okay, cool. Good. I got very far. I am still reading my book of short stories. I'm dipping in and out of it. I was going to say, I'm not sure you're still bleeding that. What? I'm not sure you're still reading that. I am. Dipping in, that, dipping in and out of it. Well, it's only a small um, book. I think you've stopped. I will start again later. Mm. I'm also reading Carpe Jugulum by Terry Pratchett. Okay. Because I love a Terry Pratchett on the go. And my non-fiction book that I'm reading at the moment is The Secret Lives of Colour by Cassia St. Clair. Sounds nice. It's really interesting. Really interesting. So a chapter on purple? Yeah. It's a chapter on all of the colours. Well, not like literally every single colour. But she's picked the most interesting colours. Um, and it's a journey, it's a journey through colour and the history of colour and where the actual pigments come from and the history of it. Did you know that um, in Oscar Wilde's time, yellow books were kind of scandalous and pornographic? And when he was arrested for gross indecency, just before he was put in prison, obviously he was arrested, he was carrying a yellow book and that's what they reported in the newspaper. It is and, that, and that was a symbol that clearly he was a terrible yeah. person. So were they actually yellow or is that what they were called? No, they were actually yellow. They were bound in yellow. <laughs> hmm, really interesting. I did not know that. So there you go. The things you learn from reading books, people. Books, good. Um, yeah. And then I'm reading my notes and I've got written down how a toilet roll company got me to hit hell yes by now within 30 seconds. Joe hasn't, I haven't told Joe about this yet. So, you know, um, we get our toilet rolls from Who Gives a Crap? Yes. And you know how we've got enough to build a fortress? Yes. We've got some more arriving in a couple of days. Good, Because they marketed at me the A to Z toilet rolls 
limited edition wrapper so that which means the I can write you which means limited I can, edition toilet roll wrapping yeah but it means that I can make you messages out of toilet rolls you'll see it's right. on brand it's on brand for me Joe it means that I can write using toilet rolls it's gonna okay. be great so I did that um also have started using bookshop.org which is awesome and it's an alternative to Amazon. Okay, nice. Yeah, and so the last few books that I have ordered, um, including Seth Godin's latest, which has just arrived, and a couple from Anne Patchett came from bookshop.org and not Amazon. Cool. Yeah. So go there, yeah, buy your you, books from there. Why do you order them from the shop in town? I do sometimes. I try, I try and spread my money around all sorts of places. But bookshop.org gives money to independent booksellers anyway, so I would imagine Rossiter Books probably gets some money from that. Also, sometimes I get my books from Hive, which is a similar thing. Okay. Anyway, today we're talking about how to avoid looking like an amateur. In what respect? In the respect that when you write a book and you're like, yeah, I've written a book, what you don't want is for people to look at it and go, oh, you're self-published. Right. What you want people to do is go, oh, wow, you've written a book, that's so cool. Okay. And so this podcast episode is going to be all about how you can avoid that kind of head tilt to the side like, oh, you're self-published. Okay, go. Yeah, because just because you're self-published doesn't mean you need to look self-published. The, the end result that we want or that I want for my clients and I would never let a book leave my um, embrace um, unless it can pass this test, is I want to be able to put your book side by side with a book published by, for example, Penguin, mm -hmm. and you should not be able to tell the difference by looking at them. Except one of them's got a penguin on the cover. You know what I mean? Okay, yep. The professionalism, the quality, the... Yeah. Everything. Yes. Just the everything. The, the everything. Yeah. The reality of it. You should be able to take your book and walk into any bookshop in the land, one day we'll be allowed to do that again, and put your book side by side with any book that you pick up off their shelves, and you should not be able to tell the difference. Okay. That is how it should be. Um, and it might mean that you need to chuck a bit more money at your book to do this, but it's worth it because you have put all of this effort and time and probably money already into writing your book, so don't ruin it at the last hurdle by putting out something that looks, that looks self-published and homemade. Because people will judge the book by its cover. They totally will. They absolutely will judge the book by its cover. And uh, because that is the nature of people. Mm -hmm. No matter how much people spout, oh, I don't judge a book by its cover. It's like, yes, you do. You absolutely do. You might then take a moment and go, you know what, am I being fair? I'm going to... But most people don't do that. Most people make that snap judgment and then they move on. Mm -hmm. So why not make a wonderful first impression? You're right. This yeah. podcast always makes you want to yawn, doesn't it? No, it's, it's sitting down being videoed. Um, and it, it's, it's like, it's like the self-conscious fact of being videoed makes me want to yawn. Really? That's a weird reaction. Um, okay. Let's start. Thing the first, most obvious thing. The cover. Yeah. Don't do it yourself. Do not do it yourself. There was, um, I saw a Facebook post, uh, a while ago now, almost probably six months ago, where somebody in one of the Facebook groups that I infrequent, um, popped up with kind of a which cover do you think is better and both of them had clearly been done with word art in word mm. and you just think really no and there is really no need because the there are even programs out there that will kind of put a book cover together for you like AI type programs that will do a better job than that even if even if you only throw a few quid at it to someone on Fiverr who has got a really good track record. Even if that's the least that you do, do that. Because, I mean, ideally, you'll go to an amazing book cover designer mm -hmm. and get a really good job done. And you can pay anywhere from, you can pay anywhere from pennies um, up to, you know, a couple of grand for a really good book cover. And I have done both. Well, I haven't paid pennies, but... Um, so two of my book cover designers, obviously Julia Brown of Brown Owl Design does my... Um, big books and then my mindles are being done by um jadine rice at k flawless nice. and she's doing a beautiful job and i'm really really pleased with them so they're going to be doing all of my mindles cool that's really cool um so yeah do not design your cover yourself just don't even if you're a graphic designer or an artist be wary about it because a book cover is a different beast from 
other other types of design. There are conventions, there are things that work and things that don't work. Mm -hmm. um, so have a look at all of the other books out there. Look at your niche, research your niche, look at other niche, niche, niches, I know you said niches, then. look at other niches and look at best-selling covers from traditionally published books as well. Look at the New York Times bestseller list. They do know, they, they know what they're doing. They do know what they're doing, yeah. They, they know what works on book covers, they know what's eye-catching, they know what sells. Mm -hmm. Um, also, have a scroll through Amazon and just see which covers jump out, jump out and catch your eye as well, mm -hmm. because you might you might then look at it a bit more closely and think, "Oh, I hate that." But you've got to you've got to bear in mind that it caught your eye for a reason, mm -hmm. and that's really important, especially when we're talking about selling books on online um, retailers like Amazon or Bookshop.org. It needs to have that stopping power. Sure. So do that. Um, right. Let's move inside the book, shall we? Have a look at numbers, headers, and footers. Okay. This is a really common area for people to fall down when they're designing their own books and doing their own work on their books. Um, so odd numbers, always on right-hand pages, always, always. Even numbers, always on left-hand pages. No exceptions to this rule. If you screw that up, that instantly people will open your book. They might not be able to put their finger on what it is, but they'll be like, this, know this is wrong. Yeah, there's something wrong with this. Um, so you know, you know when you just get like a feeling that something's yeah. not quite right, but you're not yeah, your sure. Your sub subconscious knows what's going on, but you don't. Yeah. And, and the odd numbers on the right-hand page, super important. Um, also think about the headers and footers as well. So I like to use running headers in my books. I think they're really useful to aid reader navigation. So for example, when you open up a book, you'll quite often see this, this stuff in the top header on each page. Mm -hmm. um, it can vary. Some people have the author name on the left-hand page. Some people have the book title on the left-hand page. On the right-hand page should be the chapter name. Okay. So, and it's actually really useful because when you're kind of flicking through, it's like, oh, um, if you can't be bothered, for example, to go to the table of contents. Or just spin through it, looking at the right hand page. Yeah, spin the through. The you want. Exactly, yeah. So, and also if you're reading a book and you can't remember where you are in the book, it's just a oh, quick glance up to the top. It's like, this is where I am. So that's really, really useful. Um, make sure that the numbers are easily readable and findable. Mm -hmm. Some people put the page numbers at the top. I don't actually like that. It's per it's a perfectly reasonable publishing convention. Um, there's nothing to say that you shouldn't, but I don't know why, but I expect page numbers to be at the bottom. Yeah, I, do I, you? I'd say at the bottom as well. Yeah, but there are there are books and it's reasonable to put them at the top. I just prefer them at the bottom because that's where I look for them. Um, I also prefer them in the corner, outside corner as well. Yeah, I would have thought so too. Just so that you can easily flick through and, and find the page. I would, have thought, I would have thought that was a fairly solid rule rather than... Uh something you can choose well no i mean you can it's your book you can do anything but this is this is like if you put your page number in the middle of the top page i'm i'm gonna look at it and go why have you chosen to do that it's like if it's in the outside corner of the top page i'll be less squiffy eyed at you because at least you can kind of flick through and see where it is then um i don't mind it being in the middle of the bottom of the page but it's easier to read in the oh. outside corner yeah so that's kind of up to you um but just consider is, is the page number same font size as the text? That's a very good question. Um, sometimes. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Okay. Um, I would say, yeah, probably yes. You don't want too many different font sizes on the page as well, because that looks... That's actually, that's not in my notes, <laughs> but we'll add it in now. Um, if you have a lot of different mixes of typefaces and font sizes, hmm. it looks really messy, it confuses the eye, and it screams amateur. So don't be tempted to get really super creative. It's like, have your title in one font or one size. Um, you might have a subtitle and then you might have subheadings and then your body text. So that's like a maximum of four. If you have any more than that, it's just gonna look messy. Okay. Um, what's the next thing? Uh, blank pages should be blank. Yes. And what I mean by that is, if you are starting your chapters on right hand pages which I always suggest you do you don't have to but I prefer to have my chapters starting on right hand pages again for ease of navigation mm -hmm. um, but if your previous chapter finishes on a right hand page you're going to end up with a blank left hand page mm -hmm. that blank left hand page should be blank there should be nothing on it at all um, again that's like a real sign of amateur hour yeah word, word a, has put a page number on it yeah regardless of the fact it's blank yeah it shouldn't have a page number on it it shouldn't have a header or a footer on it. It shouldn't have anything on it. It should just be totally blank. And that, again, when you start your um, chapter on the right-hand page, as another convention. Again, you don't have to do this, but I think you'll find that most books start the chapter about halfway down the page. Mm -hmm. Don't have to. I've seen 
traditionally published books that don't do that, but I prefer it. It's a good, good signpost of a new chapter, isn't it? Yeah, and also the convention is not to put, sometimes not to put, um, I don't put a running header on the, the first page of the chapter either. chapter, because you've got a big chapter title. Yeah, because you don't need it. And sometimes you don't even get a page number on the first page of a new chapter. Okay. That's kind of, I can't remember if I did that in my book or not. I definitely didn't have headers because you don't do that, but I can't remember if I put um, a number on or not. So we'll come back to numbers in a moment. Um, but yeah, blank pages should be blank. White space and margins. This is another place where um, first time authors fall down quite often. Mm -hmm. um, it's the inner margins of your book. How many times have you picked up a book? And it happens surprisingly often with traditionally published books as well. And you open it up and you're like, kind of crunching the spine open to try and read the read the page yeah, especially sure. if it's a thick book yeah so make sure that you your inner margin should be quite a lot bigger than your outer margin yes okay that's um a really simple thing to fix sorry what are you gonna say no and it's, it's a it's an enormous sign that the the whole proofing job has not been done well yeah i think so yeah because if, if it, you know it, it just doesn't work does it if, no. if you're actually struggling to you know hold the book in such a way that you can read the thing then you're, yeah. you're absolutely blown it and yeah and if you're if you're like me and you don't like to crease the spines of some of your books I, I some books i'm fine with but other books i'm like ah oh, it's a nice book i don't want to crease the spine mm. then you end up kind of with really tired hands trying to hold the book open mm -hmm. enough so you want to make sure that it's easy to read and all of the other margins as well you need plenty of space around those as well because otherwise it looks crowded you don't yeah. want the you don't want the pages to look crowded you want them to look friendly and inviting to read and you want the Plenty of space between the headers and the body text. Plenty of space between the page number and the rest of the body text as well. Because otherwise, again, it's just crowded. If that means your book ends up bigger than, you know, you were expecting, so Tough. be it. Tough, yeah. Because um, otherwise, people, it's going to be hard work to read and nobody is therefore going to read it. Yeah. Or they will be annoyed with you if they plod through it and it's hard work. So. Um, paper stock. Use the best quality paper you can afford. Because mm -hmm. thin paper looks cheap because it is cheap. You shouldn't be able to read the next page through the paper. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Um, and there is actually a genre of books, a genre of fiction that is super cheap and it's called Pulp Fiction. That's yes. where, that's where the, the name of the film came from. And that was printed on super cheap paper and it was designed to just like get them out there so people could pick them up on trains or whatever and just be like, oh, I'm just going to read this book and then yeah. dump it somewhere. Not something... Not, not something you pass down to your grandchildren, it's just... No. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I don't think that's the type of book that most people who want to write a book will want to create. Probably not. So, it's up to you. Um, no bleed through is what you're after. Yeah, for sure. So, how do you feel about, like, you know, the Bibles and the, the, the very the very finely... I remember reading something... Um, I read something by Umberto Eco and it was... Paper thin. It was so <laughs> thin. thin. It was really thin. Like tissue paper. And it was a massive book and I kind of regretted it. When I was three quarters of the way through, I just felt like I was gritting my teeth and fighting my way to the end. Because I don't think I'm bright enough to read from Berta Rico books, to be honest. I don't think that's true. Um, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about that because on the one hand, I understand why they did it because otherwise you will end up with a book that's that thick. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe you split it up into different volumes. I also am terrified I'm going to rip the pages because I'm pretty clumsy. Mm -hmm. Um, and as long as you, and if you can actually, like I say, if you can see through to the next page, it makes it difficult to read. Yeah, for sure. And so again, if you're already reading a book that's really thick and maybe a bit cerebral, you don't want to add to that effort being able to see the words coming through at you from the other side of the page. So no, um, I, I, not all tissue paper thin books are that transparent though. No. Yeah. So as long as it's not transparent. It's kind of fine, but I can't imagine that most people that I would be aiming this podcast at will be will have that problem. <laughs> so, actually, one thing that you need to keep in mind as well, and this is something I love, um, the Secret Lives of Color. But one bugbear I've got with it is the typeface is very small. Really? Yeah, and I'm you know I'm only just forty really, but at that age, at the age of late thirties, early forties, your eye start does start to deteriorate, and I do find it to be quite hard work. Okay. Um, it's not the kind of, I, I think she gets away with it because it's not the kind of book that you sit down and read from cover to cover all in one go, you kind of dip in and out of it. But even so, just bear that in mind as well, the, the size of your typeface because it needs to be easily readable. Yeah. Especially for children and older audiences, definitely you need a larger font size. Yeah. So, 
Um, layout. Oh, this is um, really easy sign to spot um, that somebody is an amateur. Is the text is ragged right, so it's like flush on the left hand side, but the right hand margin is is like that. Right. Um, a book should have justified um, lines, which means flush to the margins on each side. So does that mean the letter spacing is being manipulated? Yes. Which means that you need to either use somebody who knows what they're doing to lay out your book because otherwise you end up with some lines that are super squashed and that's another thing to consider is that if, and it, that even slips through some traditionally published books then you know no books are perfect but if, if you ever read a book and like you think oh those lines are really squashed together I mean it's called kerning and it means that the interior designer of the book has missed that mm -hmm. um, or sometimes you'll see where it's like massive spaces between the words yeah, sometimes you get like two words on a line and you think, what on earth went up in there? Yeah, it, it means that that's just fallen through the, the layout check. Um, you can get around that by A, using a professional to lay out your interior book design, which is a good idea because it is a massive ball ache. Like, it's not a fun job. And it's a it's a detailed ball ache, isn't it? It's not, not yeah. something you're going to enjoy doing. Or you can use a really cool piece of software called Vellum, um, which is... It's it's not it's not cheap, but it's not massively expensive. I bought it because I do a lot of this. It made perfect sense for me to invest in it rather than spend hours faffing around with InDesign or paying somebody a lot of money to do it. Um, but you know, if if you don't want to, if you're only writing one book or you don't want to invest in it, or you just don't want to do it because even vellum it involves work. I still have to go in and check stuff and change stuff. It's not a case of just like dropping it in and yeah, making it. Just it, import it, it and press go. Yeah, it, nothing is nothing can do that. Um, so yeah, either. Get a piece of software like Vellum or pay somebody to do a really good job of it. It's money well spent. Like the cover, it's money well spent because it's, you know, it's, it's the, once you've got all of the writing done and you've done a really good job of writing your book, if it looks like crap hmm. and it's difficult to read, you've wasted your time. Yeah. So. Or, or there's just something subconsciously that makes it feel wrong in the hands of your reader. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I never knew, you know, it was odd pages on the right and I'd never really spent much attention on where the page numbers go or the, the margin size or any of that kind of stuff. But you can still pick up a book and go, yeah, there's something not right with this. Yeah, yeah. And like I would I would know immediately what was wrong with it because I do this for a living, but you would pick it up and be like, mm, something, yeah. something. Yeah, I, yeah. Might, I might notice if it's annoying to read because the inner margins are no good or something. But yeah, for sure. But yeah, it's, uh, it does stand out. So yeah. Um, by the way, the exception to the margins and justified text and lines is if you're writing a book of poetry, you can do whatever the hell you want with a book of poetry because poetry is like word art, really. Um, so, but I don't think most people are going to be writing a book of poetry, so make sure that you follow these rules. <laughs> um, no page numbers on the front matter. And front the matter. That's everything that comes before the table of contents. Okay. So things like the copyright page, the mm -hmm. title page, other display pages, anything like part part numbers. So if you've got like a part, so I've got, I think my book has got three parts, part one, part two, part three, no page numbers on the part pages, no pages on any display page, no page numbers on any display pages at all. Okay. Really important. So page one starts on the first right hand page after the table of contents for me. Some people, if they do a preface, they will do the preface in Roman numerals. Mm -hmm. That's fine as well. And then you'll start page one at like the introduction or chapter one or whatever it is. That's fine. Um, but no page numbers before the table of contents. And no page numbers on the table of contents either. That's another mistake that I've seen okay. before. Um, also, no blank right-hand pages. We've talked about blank left-hand pages. They're fine. But blank right-hand pages, again, scream amateur. It's like somebody's made a mistake with the layout here. So if I finish a chapter halfway down a left-hand page, I start my new chapter on the right-hand page? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Um, details, 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 details. Is the ISBN correct? Does it match the barcode? I make these mistakes, so you don't have to. <laughs> that was a painful one. Does your table of contents actually match the page numbers in your book? I should check that. I've made that mistake, so you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I do have books out there floating around in which the table of contents does not bear any resemblance to what is actually going on in the book. Ouch. Nobody has contacted me about it. <laughs> I don't know. With, which, you know, you might argue says that people don't care or that they're not, they don't notice things, but people do notice. I'm, 
I'm sure, you know, I'm sure people have noticed and they just have been too kind to point it out to me. <laughs> Either that or nobody reads my books. <laughs> um, yeah. Is everything on the cover spelled correctly? <laughs> that was painful. Four people. Four people that got through. Yeah. Four people. Those books have since become collector's items, so you can always make a positive out of a negative. Um, uh, th- th- you could do some kind of checklist, I would imagine, for this kind of stuff. It's funny you should say that, because I've been compi- Every time I make a mistake, every time I screw something up on one of my books, or um, every time a mistake is made, every time I make a mistake on um, a client book, it goes onto my checklist. It's like, have you checked this? Have you actually scanned the barcode? Does the barcode match the ISBN number? All of this kind the of thing, good stuff. The thing with scanning the barcode, though, is that until it's entered on the book database, it's not going to scan as anything, so... No, but you can check that the numbers match. Oh, can you? Okay. Joe will check your barcode for you. I'm not offering that as a service. Don't, don't email Joe and ask him to check your barcode for you. I mean, $1,000, I'll do it. No problem. It's probably not worth $1,000. Don't tell him that. Okay. <laughs> 500 All right, jeez. If you bang him a tenner, he might do it. If you're not... <laughs> Um, Joe works with barcode readers, which is why he knows about these things. If you have any questions about barcode readers, ask Joe and we'll do an episode on it. Jeez. Would that be a really boring episode? That would be a super dull... Yeah. Okay. We probably might do If that. you're going to buy barcode readers, don't buy laser barcode readers anymore. What should you buy? Image-based. Mm. Much better. Much better read rates. Is that what your phone does? Yeah. Ah. Much okay. better read rates. Just as fast. Well, there you go. If you're thinking of buying a barcode reader... Don't buy a laser one. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, details. Just check all the details. Is the is everything spelt correctly on the cover? Um, is everything spelt correctly on the back cover? Don't forget the back cover. Is the, everything the spelt spine. correctly on the spine? Read the spine. Read the look spine. at it. Actually spend a moment and look at the darn thing. Yeah, because you will not see. If you glance at it, you won't see a mistake. Again. Multiple people got, got that wrong. Multiple people missed that. Yeah. And it was, it was expensive for everybody involved. Yes. Um, so, yeah, like I said, you can turn it into a positive. It can become a collector's item. But let's, let's not do it in the first place, eh? Mm. <laughs> um, but, yes, a checklist. A checklist is a thing, and I'll come to that in a moment. Cool. Uh, but finally, um, if you want to be a professional about this, show up every day and write. Um, as Stephen King said, amateurs wait for inspiration. Professionals just get up and go to work. So create a strong writing habit. Join a group that will lift you up. Um, remember that Seth Godin says, people like us do things like this. If you surround yourself with people who write every day and you want to write and be a good writer and write every day, join a group of people who will help you to do that. Mm. And just become a person who writes every day. Whether you, whether you want to or not, even if you only write 100 words, that's better than nothing. Yes, do it. Yes. And get help from professionals when you need it. This is no time to DIY your book because it will look like you've DIY'd your book. And that's when you will get people saying with their head on one side, oh, you self-published. Nice. Instead of, wow, you've written a book. How amazing. And I know what I would rather hear. Yes, absolutely. So what's the takeaway, Joe? Um, download a free book checklist. Uh, make sure your book doesn't go out with any amateur mistakes. That checklist... Is available. Is, is available from my website. It had a really stupid URL, so I've shortened it using bit.ly, and it is bit.ly forward slash moxie checklist, and the link will be in the show notes. Cool. Um, right, we've got a review. Oh, really? From Tip Top Tim. Tip Top Tim. Hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. I'm going to read it. Uh, Tip Top Tips for the small business owner. Five stars. Five stars. Five stars. Uh, these are fun, amusing podcasts fe- featuring Vicky and her husband, Joe. Uh, If you run a small business and are looking for sensible tips and tricks, interesting guests and occasional random digressions, these podcasts will fit the bill. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Tim. If you too would like to hear your name read out on the uh, podcast, leave us a review. We'll read it out if it's a bad review as well. We might not read your website address out, but... um, (laughs) um, Tim, by the way, uh, runs Invent, which is a really cool company that does R&D tax credit research for businesses in the building and construction sector. Yeah. And they they can claim millions of pounds back for businesses every year. They do claim millions of pounds back. They do, in fact, yes. He's very good at what he does. Mm. He's also a lovely man and he's obsessed with breakfasts. Yes. If you follow him on social media, you'll find him posting breakfasts, although probably less recently because we're not allowed to go out anyway. Yeah, yeah. I've seen a few breakfasts, but maybe maybe not this month. Yeah. Yes. Tim is um, a very nice man. 
So yeah, coming up next week, we are going to be talking about how to finish a chapter off, by which I mean how to stub it to death until it stops moving. Okay. Kind of. Cool. I thought that sounded more dramatic. It did. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I have a new Mindle out. You can find it on Amazon, Banish the Blank Page of Doom. Sweet. Go grab it. It's only a couple of quid. If you've already read it, please, please, please go and leave me a review on Amazon, especially if I have gone out of my way to do you a favour. Um, <laughs> And if I sound bitter, I am. Um, <laughs> no, it's, I would really appreciate if you've read it and you've enjoyed it. I would really appreciate a review on Amazon, please. Thank you. Um, because authors love that. It makes us, makes us happy. It makes yeah. us do the Snoopy dance. And I am... Oh, if you want to build a writing habit and join an amazing group of people, um, watch this space. Join my email list at moxiebooks.co.uk because I am launching a special offer for joining my team Moxie Power Hour. I've never done a Black Friday deal before, but I'm doing one this year. Nice. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be it's going to be very good value indeed. Um, and you can follow me on Instagram as well for more information. I am at Tiny Beetle Steps, all one word, nice. on Instagram. You can follow me there. I'm going to be shouting about this all over the place over the next couple of weeks. Cool. Yeah. If you've listened to every episode, email me with your postal address and I will send you something silly to say thank you. And if you like this podcast, please go and subscribe on iTunes. Nice. Raters. Five stars. Reviewers. We'll read you out. Um, or share it. Just share it. If you know somebody who will enjoy this nonsense, send them a link. moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash podcast. Cool. Thanks, Joe. No worries. We'll be back same time next week. Bye. Because I'm videoing. Okay. I got really, really itchy. Well, you need to stop doing that now. It hurts and it's itchy. It's because you stuck your face in Noodle's feet. No, I was sniffing his paws. You picked up all of the... Whatever it is he's got on his feet is now in your eyeballs. No, it's not. You've got your, like, literary weevils. No. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes.